so our speakers today, very warm welcome to Dr. Howdy Buis, who is probably we well known to, to many of you um, as the director of CGIR's Harvest Plus program. Um, it's an interdisciplinary global effort to breed biofortified food crops, um, and Howdy has been working in this area since 1993, um, promoting biofortification both within the CGIR but also with uh, research partners elsewhere uh, internationally. And I think this is a really exciting time to hear from Howdy and, and his colleagues about progress um, onto Harvest Plus. And our second speaker here is Dan Gilligan, who's a senior research fellow in IFPRI. Uh, Dan's working on the economics of household investments in education and nutrition, um, but much of his research is based on experimental and quasi-experimental impact evaluations. And I think at this moment that's of particular significance to us working in the field of agriculture because we have very few um, such high quality, the sort of the high quality impact evaluations. Um, I think at the moment internationally there's, there's a lot of growing attention to the linkages between agriculture and nutrition. Um, there, there are a number of, of um, contributing factors to that. Um, in, in the UK most recently our Prime Minister hosted a global hunger event which looked um, particularly at the interface between agriculture and nutrition. But one of the big challenges is that the evidence base on the effects of agriculture and nutrition is still not fully developed. And in DFID we funded recently a systematic review on the evidence in this area, which was published in the British Medical Journal, which looked at the evidence to date uh, in this area. Uh, we found that um, uh, to date, many, many of the, the evidence that exists is based on very small-scale studies, which have covered a very short time scale, and have used relatively weak study designs. And I think that, uh, that, that, that given the real potential for nutritional benefits to result from agricultural innovations, um, there's a real urgent need to demonstrate more fully the links using robust scientific methods. And I think that's one reason why um, today's presentation is particularly important, is that I think what, what, what uh, Dan and Howdy will present is one of the very few um, re recent large-scale randomized contr control trials in agriculture, but looking at this particular area of, of, of new biofortified crops. So I'll stop there uh, and hand over to uh, Howdy, who I think is going to start the presentation, um, and, and to Dan. And I think if we, it's probably easiest if we run through the whole presentation and then stop for... Uh, stop for questions. Uh, so I think we're going to have about uh, 20 minutes of presentation and then we'll open it up. Um, thanks. Over to you, Howdy. Okay, Rachel. Thank you very much for chairing. And um, I'm, I'm going to give uh, just a brief overview of where we are with Harvest Plus to kind of situate the study that Dan is going to be talking about. But I'll give most of the time to Dan to present the study results. So I, I think the, the first point that I'd like to make is that biofortification is a, is a new tool to, in the fight against uh, mineral and vitamin deficiencies. Um, there, we don't, we don't uh, consider in any way, shape, or form that biofortification is any kind of a silver bullet. I think that the, the ultimate solution to mineral and vitamin deficiencies is for people to have high income so that they can afford the, you know, the varied diets that we all enjoy. Uh, but it's going to take a while before we get to that point. Um, and so there are many things that need to be done along the way. So there's supplementation, there's commercial fortification. Uh, we do what we can to improve dietary diversity, but it's, uh, you know, constrained by low incomes. And now biofortification is a new approach that's now just coming online. And I wanna, I wanna make a few points about that with this slide. I think that it's really a three-step process to show that biofortification can be successful. First, we've uh, given targets to our plant breeders. So for example, um, uh, we, back in 2003 when we got started, uh, the nutritionist said that if we could uh, breed in 15 micrograms per gram of high pro vitamin A in maize, for example. White maize has no vitamin A. If we could hit that target, then we should be able to have um, uh, a public health 
significant public health benefit in countries where the orange maize would be consumed. We've been able now to the, we've been able to confirm now after plant breeding for eight nine years that we can hit the target that kind of target for the maize and for other crops uh, that we set that we set for those crops. Um, then the second step is um, undertaking efficacy trials when we have the high nutrients in the crops. Um, we need to test to, to feed those crops to micronutrient deficient people under controlled conditions. And now we have several efficacy trials to show that indeed the biofortified crops uh, can improve mineral and vitamin status. There's still several uh, studies that are out in the field where we're, we're still, uh, we don't have all the results in, but we have very encouraging results uh, on the nutrition studies as well. So finally, the third step then is uh, showing that we can uh, we can deliver, that we can scale up uh, these crops, get high rates of adoption, high rates of consumption. So we've made a lot of progress in the last year in terms of uh, releasing varieties. So if you look at this chart, we've released high iron beans now in Rwanda in June. Um, we have a high pro vitamin A cassava that was released in Nigeria last December. We have the high pro vitamin A maize, which we expect next week to uh, get approval for release. Zambian farmers will uh, plant those seeds for the first time in November. Um, high iron pearl millet seeds uh, are beginning now to be sold. They were first sold in June in Maharashtra. So in the last 12 months, um, you know, we have four new crops in four countries where varieties have been released. Um, we expect uh, high zinc rice to be released in Bangladesh next year, and we expect high zinc wheat to be released in India next year. So um, with that as background, uh, we, we have had orange sweet potatoes, high pro vitamin A sweet potatoes that have been available in Africa for the last four or five years. And um, we undertook a pilot study where we, um, we had 24,000 ho target households who were growing white sweet potato, where we did extension to uh, get them to take up the orange varieties. Uh, we studied uh, the process very carefully. And uh, Dan is going to be describing uh, what we did and what the results were. So with that as background, I'll turn it over to Dan. Thank you. Um, thanks, Howdy, very much for um, setting up and, and explaining kind of the context of, of this study that we did. So um, the project I'm going to talk about is the Orange Sweet Potato Project that Harvest Plus ran from 2007 to 2009 with support of uh, SIP and several other partners. And the purpose of the, of the project was this was at the third stage of, of introduction of biofortified crops that Howdy was talking about. So this is at the stage of running a large-scale pilot study, which we call an effectiveness trial, to essentially show that this actually works in the field. Um, and I want to emphasize that this was not a small-scale kind of one-off pilot. Um, Harvest Plus supported introduction of our sweet potato in two countries, in Uganda and Mozambique. Um, and they had targets to reach uh, 14,000 households in Mozambique and 10,000 households in Uganda over that two-year period. And we conducted uh, a randomized impact evaluation study in both countries uh, to demonstrate the effectiveness of introducing, of that method of introducing our sweet potato. First on adoption rates of our sweet potato, where, where households actually keeping the vines that they received and growing them. And then also on, on consumption of our sweet potato and dietary intakes of vitamin A as a result of consuming the sweet potato. Um, so this was a large-scale study, as I said, in, in two countries. So we were able to compare under somewhat different conditions that I'll describe in a minute the effectiveness of the orange sweet potato for reducing, for increasing vitamin A intakes and ultimately redu reducing a low vitamin A status in, in the blood. Um, the results of these studies have been published um, separately from Mozambique and Uganda. The Mozambique study is published in the British Journal of Nutrition, and the Uganda study was just published last month in the Journal of Nutrition uh, here in the United States. 
Um, so you can also see much more detail on our findings there. Um, the design of, the, of this study was, as I said, an effectiveness trial. So we wanted to compare two different methods of introducing our sweet potato. Um, the first one was a two-year intensive method of providing vines to households with some support of nutrition trainings, um, trainings on how to grow the crops, and a little bit of marketing support. And that was run for two years um, under what we called Model 1. Um, we randomly assigned Model 1 and a control group as well as Model 2, which was um, a very similar intervention but just less intensive. So the Model 2 intervention started out the same in the first year, but in the second year it scaled back with almost no activity, no interaction with the households. It was primarily as a way to save costs and reduce costs in Model 2 by about 30 percent to see if that would be as effective as the more intensive intervention. So that's a bit of background on the setup of the study. Um, we here at IFPRI, with, together with partners at Harvest Plus and, and SIP, went and collected detailed household survey data and dietary recall data from in, in both countries in 2007 and 2009. So I, I want to give you a little bit of a, of a sense of the, the difference in the context in the two countries. Um, in Mozambique, sweet potato um, is commonly consumed in Zambezia pro uh, province where we were running the study, but only as a secondary staple. It's not a primary staple in the diet, um, but it is consumed in that area. Sweet potato, this is, I'm talking about white flesh sweet potato, is known in the area, but uh, farmers were being, uh, in the study, were being introduced to the orange variety of sweet potato, that one that has a lot of vitamin A, for most of them for the first time. Um, there's only one growing season in, in Mozambique per year, um, so you have a longer dry period. Um, and in Uganda, uh, orange sweet potato is a, is a primary staple. It's a regular part of the diet. Households that consume sweet potato typically consume it at least three days a week. Um, and there's two growing seasons as well. So the dry period is shorter, which means it's actually easier to maintain the sweet potato vines between seasons. Um, Vitamin A deficiency in Mozambique is much higher than in Uganda, 71% among children under 5, whereas in Uganda is only 28%. That's still, 28% um, is still uh, relatively high. It's considered a public health problem, um, but not nearly as high as in Mozambique. Uh, infrastructure is definitely um, worse in Mozambique than in Uganda, and education levels are higher in Uganda as well. Then one of the main implications of this for the design of the, of the project itself is that in Mozambique, the project uh, provided vines every year to households because they, it was difficult for them to maintain access to sweet potato from one year to the next, whereas in Uganda, households only received sweet potato once and then were able to maintain it themselves. Um, so one time in August 2007. So all the results you see here for Uganda are based on a one-time distribution. Okay, so um, let me get right to the findings. First, our first finding is about the adoption of orange sweet potato itself. And you can see in this slide, for those that can see it, um, in, in Mozambique, uh, we compare, so we're, in this case, we're averaging the, the adoption rates in our Model 1 and Model 2 households um, and comparing those to the households in the control group. So in Mozambique, 68% of households that gained access to orange sweet potato in, uh, in 2007 we're growing, still growing it in 2009. Um, sorry, the, the, it was almost 80% that were still growing it in Mozambique. The control group, almost 8% of control group house, uh, households had access to it. So in the end, you end up with two-thirds uh, two of households um, being caused to grow orange sweet potato as a result of the project. In Uganda, the effect was slightly smaller, but basically above 60% of households who got access to the crop were still growing it two years later. Um, that's highly effective in terms of adoption rates for any agricultural intervention. Um, you, it's, you don't see take-up rates nearly that high, except in rare cases of something like the Green Revolution. Um, so adoption was there, and that was very encouraging. The next question for us is, are these households consuming it? And in particular, are the children in these households and adult women uh, also consuming the crop? So the next slide is about um, the rates of vitamin A intakes um, among households that had access to the orange sweet potato. Um, if you look at the published research, we can show a large increase in intakes of orange sweet potato 
And that ultimately leads to these graphs here, which is a measure of the intake of vitamin A itself. So as I mentioned, we, we, part of our household survey interviews included a detailed interview with the mother about the, um, everything that was consumed in the last 24 hours by a target child, an index child, we, we called it, in that household. So we took a child, in this case, case between ages 6 and 35 months, so an under 3-year-old, and asked the mother, tell me everything that this child ate in the last 24 hours. And in a very detailed, structured interview, captured all sources of food and converted that into nutrients um, and minerals uh, to be able to measure the intakes of vitamin A. So what you see here from Mozambique is the effect of the project on increasing uh, those recall measures of vitamin A intakes for children under three. Um, and the, the long bars are those where you see a big increase in intakes of vitamin A. Um, th these are really impressive increases. Um, the, the estimated requirement, average requirements for children at this age range is about 200, a little bit above 200 uh, micrograms per day. And the effect of the project itself was about equal to that. So um, on average, intakes in Mozambique were a little bit um, below estimated requirements, and, and those intakes were nearly doubled as a result of the project. So it's a really large increase in, in vitamin A, and as I mentioned, we showed in our research that that increase was due directly to the increase in consumption of our sweet potato. Uh, in Uganda, the, the Uganda started off in a better position where, um, on average, most children had um, were consuming uh, vitamin A above the requirements. Um, but that, that average masks, of course, that not all, that was not true for all children. But the effect on average uh, intakes was still a large increase in model one, almost 200, 192 micrograms, and above 200 micrograms in model two. So still a really large increase uh, in vitamin A intakes in Uganda as a result of introducing our sweet potato. So those are just average effect sizes across all children under age three in the sample. Uh, now I want to show you the effect on uh, the prevalence of inadequate intakes, because ultimately what we're, what we're concerned with is improving intakes for children that did not have access to vitamin A or had low access to vitamin A uh, when the project started. And here, these results are just from Uganda, and this is for a slightly older uh, reference group of children. Um, uh, sorry, it's, here you actually see the results for all three reference groups. So in the first panel, uh, you see for young children, those under age three. The middle panel is for children that raised three to five at baseline. And then in the right-hand panel, you see for adult women. Um, what we show is that the prevalence of children who had inadequate vitamin A intakes falls in Uganda from almost 50% to about 12% as a result of the project. So that's a really sharp reduction in the prevalence of inadequate vitamin A intakes. We're talking about dietary intakes from all food sources, but it's arm sweet potato we showed that's driving this big gain in improvement of, in, in vitamin A intakes. So for young children, there's a, about a 33 percentage point decline in prevalence of inadequate intakes. Um, for children aged three to five, we did not show a significant effect on, um, in reducing prevalence of inadequate intakes in part because the control group had a big improvement in, in their intakes as well in that period for children in that age. So there's no significant effect there. But there's also a very large effect in reducing the prevalence of inadequate intakes of vitamin A for women. Um, and you want to reach women, of course, because uh, they're in their childbearing years, the women in the sample, and um, by reaching them and improving their vitamin A intakes, you're improving the vitamin A intakes of their future children. So um, those measures all talk about the effects on vitamin A intakes. Um, that's really encouraging news, and the effect sizes, as I mentioned, are really large. Uh, ultimately, what we want to be able to demonstrate is that that's improving vitamin A status um, in, in blood samples or through other met methods of showing that vitamin A status and people's physical health has improved. Uh, a study by Jan Lowe at, at SIP and her partners had already demonstrated this for Mozambique in a similar study on using orange sweet potato that uh, serum retinol and, and prevalence of vitamin A deficiency had declined. So we didn't repeat that component in Mozambique, but we did undertake um, blood samples in Uganda 
to show the impact of introducing our sweet potato on serum retinol, serum retinol being a measure of, of um, vitamin A status in the blood. So we took vitamin A samples on those children that were aged 3 to 5 at baseline. Um, and what we found was that for children that had low serum retinol um, at a cutoff of uh, 1.05 micromoles per liter, so um, this is a slightly higher cutoff, you should know, than the cutoff that's typically used for vitamin A deficiency. Um, so this, these are children that would be considered vulnerable to vitamin A deficiency, but they were not all vitamin A deficient at baseline. Um, in that sample, what we showed was that the project reduced the prevalence of kids that still had that low status by nearly 10 percentage points. It's by 9.5 percentage points. Um, so again, that's really encouraging evidence that we're, the project is actually improving vitamin A status in the blood. We also showed that children, that the consumption of vitamin A as reported in the dietary recall measures was associated with the average serum retinol. So it's very clear to us, um, with very convincing evidence in the study, that it's the orange sweet potato that's having this effect on serum retinol. Um, so to be clear, what we demonstrate um, is sort of following the, the project through the impact pathways. We introduced orange sweet potato and important messages about how to grow it and the benefits of consuming it and, and about nutrition. Um, we showed that uh, about two-thirds of households as a result of the project were now growing orange sweet potato, that it reached the diet of, of important target groups like young children under three and women, and that ultimately that improves vitamin A status in the blood. So this is exactly the kind of evidence that um, Harvest Plus is looking for to show that vitamin A or that biofortification can be effective, and we've demonstrated it in two countries um, in, really, in a really large pilot study. Um, I just want to show one more slide, if you can bear with me. Um, it just talks about the implications of this for policy. First is on cost. So we've showed large benefits of, the, of introducing our sweet potato. Um, is it cost effective? Um, an analysis undertaken by Harvest Plus and, and, and colleagues showed that um, if we use disability-adjusted life years saved, um, which is a common way of, of trying to measure the effectiveness of health interventions, that um, in, in Uganda, the intervention cost about 15 to 20 dollars per dally saved. Um, and that's, that's a rate that, that would rank it among highly cost-effective interventions um, if you compare it to all kinds of health interventions to, um, to save disability-adjusted life years. So in terms of cost-effectiveness, the project ranks well. Um, and we have ongoing research that's going to continue to look at cost-effectiveness and provide more evidence there. Um, next, just in terms of scaling up, Harvest Plus is moving forward on that in Uganda. They have uh, funding to reach 225,000 households in Uganda by 2016. And uh, those of us here at IFPRI are continuing to work with Harvest Plus on that um, to, to do further studies on, on optimal diffusion uh, methods. And SIP, the International Potato Center, is also working in 10 countries across uh, Africa, including in Mozambique, to scale up introduction of our sweet potato. Okay, I'll leave it there, and, and let's turn to questions uh, for those that are still have time to be with us. Thank you. First of all, congratulations. It sounds like it's a, it's a really commendable success. Uh, uh, you, you've made it a rather sober presentation, but I, to me, it's, it looks like a very, really very enthusiastic uh, thing. My question is, why uh, are we doing this now? Why has this type of uh, procedure not been done long time ago? Vitamin A deficiency has been well known for a long time. Um, uh, 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 breathing techniques exist. Um, so why are we doing this now? The reason that the question is not a, um, a rhetoric question, but it's more in order to understand what are the factors that are perhaps uh, moving against this type of very positive development that we see right now. What, what are the obstacles that we're still facing when we want to introduce this type of thing? The first barrier was uh, what I call the 10-year barrier. Uh, plant breeding uh, takes a while to, uh, it takes eight, nine years to develop a variety, uh, get it through the varietal release committees for release. 
So when I went to donors uh, 10 years ago, I said, uh, you know, we need lots of money for this. It's going to be really good in 10 years from now. Okay. And, uh, you know, donors, that's, that's a very long time frame. Well, uh, we were fortunate uh, that, uh, you know, several donors, the Gates Foundation, uh, DFID, Canada, uh, you know, they, they agreed to, um, you know, fund us for that period of time. Uh, so now we're finally, uh, we have the varieties uh, beginning to be released. And now it's, uh, now it's much easier to raise funding because we can say that we have impact. We can have impact immediately as we do the scaling up of the varieties. I think another, another barrier has been, um, is uh, to be able to show it. It's related to the 10-year period, but it's being, being able to show uh, impact. Uh, show conclusively that this strategy can work. And so it's these kinds of um, uh, studies that Dan just described that I think can show that, uh, that the strategy is successful. Howdy, I know uh, there are a lot of, um, I think, um, um, misconceptions about biofortification in, in, the, in the international community and a lot of questions and challenges. And one is around the whole issue of consumer preferences. Um, and, and concerns that uh, we're introducing a new crop, often with different visible traits. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about uh, what we know about um, the challenges of, of dealing with that. And, and the second one is um, the, the sort of um, misperception that um, all biofortified technologies are or u utilize GM or biotechnology. Um, can you just explain a little bit more about the technologies that Harvest Plus is using in particular? Sure. On the on the first question, I, when you um, when you put vitamin A, pro vitamin A, into the crops through breeding, it changes the color from white to either yellow or orange. And if you um, if you don't give any information to consumers or to farmers, they'll find it a strange color and they won't uh, necessarily take it up. Uh, but we found uh, certainly in this study that Dan just presented on the sweet potato, once you give them the information that these crops can protect the children uh, and mothers from vitamin A deficiency, and you also show that these crops are just as high yielding as the white sweet potato, that once you give them that information, then they'll switch. Um, the issue is how to give them that information in a cost-effective way. So if you go door to door uh, and give them the information, they get it, uh, but it's very expensive and you can't, uh, you can't scale up doing things that way. If you put things on radio programs, you can reach a lot of people at low cost, but we also think that you need some kind of uh, direct face-to-face -face contact to really get people to, uh, to switch. So what we found is that working through NGOs, for example, in Africa, we can work through their networks. They have the, they have regular meetings that they hold. So we get the NGOs on board. We train their personnel, and then working through their networks is a cost-effective way of doing that. Um, the other question about uh, the different techniques: you can use both conventional breeding and transgenic methods to put uh, the higher levels of minerals and vitamins in the crops. Uh, Harvest Plus took a decision from the beginning uh, that we would uh, work toward developing and releasing only uh, conventionally bred crops. It's basically because we didn't want to um, uh, run up against the barriers that those working on transgenics uh, run against. Uh, even uh, growing crops outside uh, during the breeding process you need special permissions with transgenic crops. That slows the process down. And then once the crops are ready to be released, uh, there are many more barriers uh, to get approvals for release. And even if you surmount those barriers, there, there are political um, barriers that you have to get around. So we just decided uh, under Harvest Plus, we would just work with conventional breeding. I was wondering, in particular because of this point that came up already that there might be an issue with the um, the long the short terms that donors are thinking and we're conducting this interview this virtual briefing here on the global donor platform 
Um, do you see any particular things that would need to be addressed by the donors to actually move forward? I know that's just maybe not your your area of specialization, but I'm sure from your experience, you have a lot of you have a lot of um, yeah experience with with, uh, with the donors, and and maybe you can also think of, of ways that a particular donor platform, a, a network, can actually help with that. Is there any ideas from the two of you? But I think one of our challenges in terms of the donors is right now most of the funding that Harvest Plus receives is coming from the agricultural um, uh, components of the of the of the donors. The the health and nutrition uh, groups um, are still, you know, they they see that we're now coming out with this new evidence, such as Dan just presented. Um, but we're still hoping that the percentage of total funding that we get for Harvest Plus in the future uh, will increase among the health and nutrition sections uh, of the donors. But uh, but we're in a much we're in a much better place now. We're currently coming to the end of our phase two. We work in five year phases. The end of phase two is 2013. We're well funded to the end of next year. But starting in 2014 to 2018, we're now in the process of raising funding for phase three. And our, our costs will be higher in phase three than phase two because we're getting into delivery. And delivery is, uh, is more expensive than the, uh, than the development of the crops. Yeah, thank you. this is Dan. I, I'll just add um, uh, a point to what Howdy said. Um, I think there's now sufficient evidence from our studies and from other studies that had come before um, that, that biofortification has a, a role to play and can be cost effective in a number of settings. As, as Howdy said, it's not a silver bullet. It's not going to work everywhere in, um, under all conditions, but it's, it's going to work in a lot of places um, and because of the crops, the staple crops they're working with. And so um, what we're looking for is, is um, sustained interest and patience on the part of donors uh, to recognize that this um, is, is really a cost-effective intervention um, and that uh, ultimately the nutrition objectives that it is designed to achieve um, can really be, be tackled in a number of countries. Uh, so hopefully the combination of, as Howdy said, is a challenge that um, comes from an agricultural intervention with nutrition objectives. Um, trying to get get donors from both sides of that of that problem uh, to to be interested and stay interested, uh, but we're hoping this kind of evidence uh, contributes to that. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, this has been a really interesting uh, presentation, and there's no doubting the the benefits and uh, of this biofortification program. You know, CETA we've been strong supporters. We've been very happy with seeing the results come out, and uh, and now seeing uh, a bit more of the evidence come through. But um, I just wanted to continue a, a bit of a conversation I had with Howie last week, and it's something uh, it's a persistent debate I've been having, um, not only within development agency but at, at home, <laughs> um, and that is the the impact of uh, the change in, in cultural acceptance of of, of food. Um, we're going into these societies and we're con slowly convincing people that uh, sufficient nutrition can be obtained through eating staple crops, um, and uh, to, to, to sort of provide a very similar story, um, my wife's an elementary school teacher, and she's been challenging me. So, so one of the challenges we're having now in Canada is um, you have a lot of uh, snack food that is filled with uh, nutrition, and so children and, and, and slowly school nutrition programs are being convinced that you don't need to feed your kids you know, fruits and veg because they can get sufficient vitamins from sugary cereal and, uh, uh, and other snack foods. And so this cultural shift, is, is, it there, is there not a danger 10 years down the road that we've created societies that will understand that they can get sufficient nutrition from staple crops and, and that impact on, on diets? I'm just curious about the long, long-term challenges of shifting uh, cultural dietary practices. If you could just comment a bit on that, it would be interesting. Yeah, yeah. That, 
Yeah, Nikita, that, that issue comes up quite a bit. Um, I, I think the best, maybe the best way I can answer that question is, um, is you take, take the example of what happened with our households in Uganda and Mozambique. We did a lot to improve their vitamin A intakes, to reduce vitamin A deficiency. We didn't solve all nutrition problems for those people. Those, those households still face, you know, many nutrition issues. Uh, we, we did something to raise their vitamin A intakes in a cost-effective way. Other biofortified crops will do something to raise iron intakes, to raise zinc intakes in a cost-effective way. By no means, is, again, I just emphasize, by no means is this a silver bullet. We're just, we're just doing something to increase, substantially increase, iron, zinc, and vitamin A intakes. But that doesn't solve uh, the malnutrition problem. Now, I, I'll, um, I'll tell you a story from 1996. Um, we were, we were um, our level of funding back then, I tried to get this thing started between 1993 and 2003. And we had all of $350,000 a year from the Danish government, which was the only thing kind of keeping the idea alive. And there was another, another country in Europe uh, where the CGR representative uh, wanted to give us a million dollars, but he turned it over to the nutritionist to recommend whether to make the grant to what was then the CGI or micronutrients project. And they said, no, we think this will take focus away, this kind of intervention will take focus away from the true, um, the true solution, which is dietary diversity. So I, I think that's, uh, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, some people argue that if you do something to help solve the problem in one way, then that takes focus away from what's the real solution. I, you know, I just don't, I just don't buy into that kind of argument. That's exactly uh, one of the, the debates we have here about, you know, uh, short-term results versus, uh, you know, what's the vision for development we have in 20, 30 years, and it's, it's a continual debate, and there's no real uh, correct answer, but I, I do like your approach, and uh, I think I think it's, it's the right way to go. Thank you. Great. Well, I, th I think that's been a really rich and useful discussion. Many thanks to uh, to Howdy and Dan for for uh, talking us through that. I mean, I think three points that, that I took away from that. I mean, I, th I think um, Howdy's point that, that, that it's not a silver bullet, but Clearly, um, there are a number of new ways to support nutrition through agriculture, and, and biofortification is clearly one tool in, in this growing toolbox um, with a growing ev evidence base. And uh, the results on orange flesh sweet potato, which is clearly the furthest on in terms of these new biofortified crops, uh, really shows some very robust evidence and some very interesting results both on adoption as well as uh, intakes and vitamin A status. But I think. Um, uh, the, the, the articles, the published articles themselves also um, uh, show some, some other very useful uh, lessons on, on the cost effectiveness and different delivery models. Um, so biofortification is ready for scale up. There's good evidence on its cost effectiveness and, and uh, the extent to which it could be sustainable. But we know that rollout is not without its challenges and maybe that's a challenge to us all in the global donor platform. Um, big issues around how we engage with private sector and public partners on scale up. Uh, I think there's a whole set of questions which uh, may be a, a topic for another discussion on how do we mainstream this approach within SUN frameworks, within CADAP frameworks, and then how do we measure adoption and, and nutritional outcomes of some of these new crops, and, and, and what sort of what's the kind of quality and extent of the evidence that we need to bring development partners. Uh, both from the agriculture and the health um, uh, areas together uh, to, to help understand the kind of real potential of, of biofortification. So I think there's some real issues and challenges for, the, for, for us there on, in the global platform on, on engaging with, our, with, with, uh, with these issues and grappling with the whole challenges of, of delivery. Uh, and, I, and I think we'll hear more of that in, in the months and, and years to come as uh, Harvest Plus pulls, pulls together its roadmap for scaling up and delivering some of these new crops. 
So uh, a very big thank you to, to Howdy and to, to Dan for a really interesting and, and useful presentation. Um, and many thanks to everyone for calling in.